the ground now. Oh, okay, right, okay. Oh, good, up, good morning, good afternoon. Um, look, this is a fairly... I think we're now live. We're now live, okay. Well, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. This is meant to be a fairly quick one. I'm going to talk about... Um, a short th- article. A short article, yeah. It's actually at one stage, it was 1,020 words, but it went up to 1,250. Smallest article I've ever written. It will take you five minutes to read it. And very simply, it's um, inspired for, by an article that was up on Nexus for Duncan Rose. I've got the Rose. link to that in the description too. So oh, if Evan. you want to read the original article, oh, okay. you can. Thank you, Evan. Um, thank you for that. It's an article in Nexus Feed. And primarily what the article was about was about a person, a Greek astronomer called Hipparchus. He was around from 190 BC to 120 BC. And he was considered, considered to be the father of um, scientific astronomy. And a group of scholars believe they found fragments in his writings of what they claim to be the oldest star map, map yet found. The article is very good. Um, and my critique is not at the article. The researchers, and certainly not Duncan's um, Nexus Feed, none of those things. My critique is about the fact that as they talk about this, and plenty of the elder talks about Aparchus and what led him down this celestial path and why he did this, and that's all good. Everything's wonderful. And the date they've come up with is around 2,200 years. And that's supposed to be, according to the experts, the oldest star map in the world. Well, the whole time I was reading that, all I could keep thinking was, well, this is wrong. This is wrong. And the story is, ladies and gentlemen, in the 1980s, when people were looking at the carry-on glyphs on Paul White before he was deceived by Sydney Uni into believing that it was all a fake, had a group of people up there, and one went up the top, away from the glyphs, Directly above it, 50 metres away, is a set of star markers. And the person involved, I've no idea why they did this. I don't know who they were. They decided to chart it up and then contact Sydney Uni, who agreed to it, look at this actual star chart. And ladies and gentlemen, that's where the story ended. We'd heard about this for years, this mythical star chart that Sydney Uni had dated and they'd marked it out and they'd found... And we heard dates of four and a half thousand years and older, which makes it at least twice as old as this official star map here, but here it is in Australia. But of course, the story was Sydney Uni did it, and it was a story like a lot of things, and we figured it was just there as a red herring. And then one day we got the map, the star chart. And it was, actually. And of course, people went to Sydney Uni and said, where's the star chart? And what they said was, oh yeah, we got one, and we dated it, but we forgot what the date was, we got no records, and we lost it. And that was the story. But lo and behold, the star chart does have their name on the top of it. It is dated, and it's dated at 2500 BC, and it's given a month, a day, down to the minute on that chart, which you will see in the article. It tells you exactly when this was compiled. And it's over 4,500 years, double the the actual uh, date of this other thing that 12 scholars are working on at the moment. And it's been authenticated by Sydney Uni. They didn't deny they didn't do it. They just denied they knew where it was. Well, we do. And we wrote an article about this about five years ago. And we said, we've got the map, here's the date. It is the oldest date in the world. And you know what? They don't care. There's no protection there. There's no recognition. There's no acknowledgement. No one wants to talk about it. They just want it to go away. Even though they did it. It's their work. It's Sydney Uni's work. They can't deny it. You'll see the map in the article. We put it up there. What I find interesting is, why is it? a date that's less than half of what we've got in Australia, 12 different scholars are working on this site to try and authenticate it and work out what it means. In Australia, no one wants to talk about it. No one wants to say a thing. All they want to say is we lost it, it goes away, I don't want it to be here, oh my God, it is, oh well, we won't talk about it. 
Now, all I can say into this, or I don't know why they've done this, but what I could put to you is that that, those, that particular star marker is very, very close to the glyphs. The glyphs talk about a time when the two sons of Khufu were around, which is 4,500, 4,600 years ago. And then up above there is a star chart made with rock on rock. It's unlike the, the, the glyphs. They're different. They're made with a blade. This is rock on rock made by original people. And we believe it's the date when a, ceremony, when a, a treaty was agreed to between the Egyptians and the original people, and that's why they marked the actual star chart directly above the glyphs, and it's the closest one to it, to authenticate it. But of course, if you were to acknowledge that that was the right date, and that it backs up the story about the two sons of Khufu being there, that could be a fairly big problem. That might cause issues. And there's another issue. There's actually a subdivision taking place, which would be about 300 metres from where the star chart is. Now, the law is when there's an authentic site, authentic archaeological site, no development must take place within 500 metres in any direction. So now I'm starting to wonder why that particular star chart was lost, then found, then still ignored, not talked about, because if it was talked about and it was examined, they'd find that this star chart is the oldest in the world, would have to be protected, and all development that's taking place within 500 metres of that site would cease and desist. And that would mean that the actual subdivision which has been sponsored by the Darking Nong Lands Council and the New South Wales government. And even though they want to go ahead with it, they'd have a problem, ladies and gentlemen, simply because of the fact it's inside the 500 metres. Anyway, it's a small article and I'm making the point. I think there's something dreadfully wrong here. The second thing I want to very briefly talk about is the fact that we're doing, we're doing a presentation on um, Omar's three-day... It's got a three-day conference with people talking and likes to make them big. And we're on the Monday and we're going to be talking about the magic box and think that in fact, the whole thing is called the magic box. And that leads into the third part of this because we do believe that first ceremony that turned on the magic box, when there's another ceremony coming up in this solstice, and that begins the process. And it brings us down to something, we've read this often to you and we're not going to read it again, about the Hopi prophecy which talks about if people don't learn the old teachings, they don't learn them, if they don't understand them, they will not be part of this change. They've made that very clear. And to that end, we're still, and here's the cover of the book Interview with an Alien, and we're still... Oh man, there's been a lot of things that have happened recently, apart from the shadow banning, um, apart from the fact that this book was actually, should have been out two months ago, and a series of unbelievably dodgy events have taken place to hold it back, hold it back, hold it back, time after time after time. And then the last online conference we did, half the people couldn't get on, and we did the same thing we normally did, but they never got any information. We keep thinking that everything we're doing at the moment is being blocked in different ways. But eventually, this book will come out. And the reason I'm recommending this book to people is because the Hopi talk about learning the old teachings. Well, these are the oldest teachings they are. Because Mesref was around before the earth was. And he's taken an interest in the earth before we were even existing here. And these are the oldest oldest teachings you can get and what I'm going to do very quickly in the time I've got now I'm just going to, just for those people who've never heard of this stuff or heard what he's got to say I'm very brief, briefly going to read out four comments that he made and what I'm going to say to you is this book is made up of about nearly I think 50 or 48 full page plates of different aliens with one sentence comments on the other side Leah writes about 25 pages, I write about 6 or 7, and all the rest of it is primarily questions and answers we actually did. 
Um, now, we had a problem with this because I told everyone, do not. Just leave the question and answers with the bad grammar, whatever we said in response to what Mesrev said. Leave it as it is, which we did. And then what we also did was we made sure that we got some sort of co computer that could take our spoken word into the written word. Well, unfortunately, when it came to my written word, just none of it came out properly. And that held us up because we had to redo the whole thing. But then after that, the book company have held us up many, many times. But eventually it will get out. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to read a few comments to you that Mesref made to give you an idea of who is this person and whether it's worth your time to even bother looking at this book he's got. Now, I'm just going to fill it in. A couple of the questions I asked. The first one I asked him about the Big Bang Theory, and I asked him whether the Big Bang was the beginning of life. And I'll read to you what he said. The Big Bang was a point of change, but life existed before. Like the many other cataclysms before, when life decided to change, we can still see the waves of the Big Bang rippling out into the black and its many predecessors. Life changes. It's a must, for the universal stagnates and its consciousness falters. Don't fear the death of life as you know it. Fear the death of challenge. Now, it's interesting he went further on to tell us further on that they found ripples before the Big Bang. In fact, there were six before it. And this was the seventh bang, not the first. And we think um, the first bang created life. And he said life existed before any of the bangs, so all of them. He's got a completely different take on what life is. Right, the second one I'm going to read to you, and I'm only going to do three today. It's the second one I've read quite a few times before, and I'm going to read it again because I think it's quite deep and it's meaningful and it's only eight words. And the sentence was about this. I've been trying for quite some time to lock in with Mesref. What is it about humans that all aliens admire? And he's told us that's the case, but we don't seem to find out what it is. On this occasion, I asked him, what qualities do humans have that you find most appealing and inspiring? And what qualities do they possess that you find the most disappointing? I expected two answers. I expected a couple of sentences on each, and I got one sentence, eight words on both. Humans create innovative ways to cheat the test. Now, as I said, the best way to work out whether you think that this business about us being in, well, Leah being in contact with aliens and whether it's actually true, you know what the best way to do this is? Have a listen to what he says. I want to close with this one, and this is one I asked him about and it was to do with the fact that I watched a group of birds recently and they all would change, there's about 10,000 10, birds, it was a large flock and I could watch how they change directions time after time after time. <coughs> and every time they did it, they all seemed to know when they were going to do it. And it made me think quite recently in, in Asia, there was a, a group of humans, I think a lot of them, and they were moving together. And then they moved the wrong way and 150, 200 died and hundreds got injured. It just seems to me, and when you look at the animals, whether they be zebras or bison, when they stampede, they don't run over the top of each other. Only humans do it. And I said to him this. Okay, I asked him about, um, I'm looking at the birds here. I said, um, and I start here, I never Clive, and it says here the word Clive. I was actually, I don't understand, I don't know who Clive is. This thing was turning everything around into something else. Is this all through one bird's communication, or all are all the birds communing through, communicating through some form of communal telepathic thought process that we don't fully understand? Asking how come the birds can all change the same way and don't run into each other? And this is what he said. It was a bit of a surprise. It wasn't quite what I expected, but it often isn't. The living and the dead ride the waves of the sea of consciousness. We all feel it, but not all know it. It's part of the invisible orchestra of the universe. In some places, the music is mute, while in other places, the music is full. The earth has a song, but it's a pity. Only a few can hear it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what this book is basically about is us asking Mesref about 150 questions, which is roughly what's there, his responses to that, and then our responses. Now, I can tell you that um, the responses that we gave, 
I had to go back over because I just couldn't understand what was written there. Mesref became Midref. Um, uh, all the things changed. The, uh, you take Lemurians, they became myriads. And Edgar Cayce becomes education. And virtually every word I said got turned into something else and it was just unreadable. So we had to go back and redo the whole thing, which we did, and we did that quite some time ago because there's a full-page ad for this book in Nexus that went out last month, and it's still not ready, but it will be ready, I would suggest, within a week. And what I am going to suggest to people, if you want to pre-order with us, now I've got to make one point with this book. If you have a look right now, this whole section here, they're all the pictures. There's about nearly a hundred pages on both, both sides with pictures and sentences there. And they're full page ads and it's high quality. Now that meant the pr price of this book, which is un unlike any book you've ever seen before, because the two main sections are about 50 plates of aliens and uh, Lee would write one sentence comments about each of them on the opposite side. Then about 140 pages of question and answer and then little bits by us. Now, what I'm going to suggest to you is if you read what Mesrev says, you've read the old teachings. And that's what the Hopi, that's what the original people, that's what all the indigenous people are saying is in, 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 in vital in the change that's coming ahead, that you must understand the old teachings. Well, they're in this book, and very soon the book will be out. It is out in electronic form, but... You don't get this, it's a much better as a book because you can go back to the commentaries, you can look at the pictures, you can look at Leah's description and she, she's brilliant at putting character and thoughts into the faces of these aliens she draws. And whether you believe or not, she's is in contact with the aliens, we'll read her section which she explains how it happened. So ladies and gentlemen, new article up, only 1,000 and a bit about another part of archaeology in Australia that's been hidden. A uh, conference we'll be talking on in a couple of day about, days about the changes taking place. And I'm hoping within a week we can start sending our copies. Now, you can buy the copies through uh, Amazon and all that sort of stuff, and you'll get it. I think they're going to be $45 because there are so many pictures in here. <coughs> Or you can get it off us. Now, if you get it off us, we'll sign the books. And what we'll also do is on, on the inside cover, on each one of the inside covers of the books we actually sign, we'll write a commentary about what the book's got inside and we will never repeat them. That'll be slightly different. Now, what that'll mean, it'll be the $45 plus the postage on top, but you will get it from us. And that would also mean we get, a slight, we get more of the actual profit and I can share it between Leah and Evan who need that. Anyway, but if you want that, you'll get a, a hand signed by all of us, plus a comment, a large commentary about what's inside the book, and we'll keep changing it each time for you. So think about pre-ordering with us, and certainly um, come and see our conference on Monday, and have a look at the article we've got there. And at that, I think I've kept that down to 18 minutes, which for me is nearly a miracle. And now, I've lost the mouse. Evan... Mouse is gone. You just gotta press the button. Oh, there it is. <laughs> right, mouse is knock.